All right, in this series, I'm going to be giving you a brief introduction to formal logic, and we're going to be using as a companion text one of the most important recent texts in the field from the most important living and perhaps ever philosopher, Stefan Molyneux. The text is his newest book, The Art of the Argument, and for those of you unfamiliar with Molyneux's work, his most famous contributions include the discovery of contradictions, the refutation of God, proving morality is objective, um, and finally the shocking discovery that many of the things people say are not, in fact, arguments. For those of you unfamiliar with the more technical side of philosophy, you may have thought that Steph was just a raving lunatic, or a simple-minded fool. But, in fact, Stefan's writings are simply so profound that even most practicing philosophers have failed to recognize his importance, much like Hegel or Derrida. If you still don't believe me, here are some quotes about Steph from some of his peers. Wisest is he who knows he knows nothing. That was said by Socrates, but it's a little known fact that it was in reference to Steph. Stefan is clearly the most impressive intellect the world has ever known. His contributions to philosophy are no less than to have posed and solved all of its most important problems. He is also a fantastic lover and a handsome son of a gun. And that was Plato. I'm pretty sure it's in the Republic somewhere. And finally, whereof one cannot speak, thereof one must ask Steph. And that was Wittgenstein in the Tractatus. So there you have it. My aims in this series are twofold. Uh, the first is to communicate Steph's highly dense and confusing thought to the less prepared reader in the hopes that finally the world will see the true philosophical capabilities of Stefan Molyneux. And the second aim is to give a brief, hopefully accessible and entertaining introduction to some basic ideas in reasoning and logic along the way. We'll start, sensibly enough, at the beginning. And in part one, Steph basically just waxes lyrical about reason, evidence, and all that good enlightenment stuff. He may also somewhat overstate the importance of the argument, as he calls it, um, by claiming that, among other things, it is peace, love, truth, beauty, contraceptive to the beastly scourge, the robust sport that stops hysterical escalation, and life itself. And this is presumably in a tenuous attempt to connect the argument with our continued advance as a civilization. The short version is that Steph thinks arguments, reason, and evidence are very important and would like you to do the same. We can also translate this using what's called the Molyneux transformation, or an analogy to you and me. And this will enable him and his viewers to more readily interpret it in Molyneuxian. And the translation would be, imagine there's a kid who loves chocolate ice cream. Molyneux is the kid, the ice cream is the argument. Now, since this section isn't an argument, nor does it contain one, we'll move right along. In section 2, we're given a definition of the word argument, which, again, is not an argument, but we're getting closer. Um, Steph's definition is an attempt to convince another person of the truth or value of your position using only reason and evidence. He also distinguishes between two types of arguments, uh, truth and value arguments. For the moment, we'll just ignore this. Stefan continues his uh, discussion of truth arguments by introducing his readers to the age-old distinction between deductive and inductive arguments. After explaining the basics of deduction, Steph immediately launches into a tirade against relativists. The word relativists, in Steph's sense, means people who don't think there is any certain knowledge whatsoever. Relativists might say that deductive knowledge comes as close as we can get to certainty, but falls tragically short or that it's not even close, um, and they could, you know, be total Peronian skeptics who just doubt everything. Steph says of these people, getting most modern thinkers to accept the absolutism of deductive reasoning is like trying to use a nail gun to attach electrified jello to a fog bank. And, in case you were wondering, talking to Steph is like being the jello with a nail gun wielding madman bearing down on you. But don't take my word for it, listen to these testimonials from people actually talking to Steph. Hello? Hello? Hey, how's it going? Um, okay. <laughs> no, sorry. I don't understand. <laughs> right. So, I think his point with the analogy is that relativists are hard to pin down. 
Much of the rest of this section is devoted to an attempt at persuading the reader to endorse Steph's quasi-Aristotelian take on classical logic and the alleged certainty it provides. Uh, meaning, wherever true premises are placed in a valid argumentative form, one is rashly compelled to accept the conclusion. Um, there's one other thing Steph mentions before closing the chapter. He says about deductive inference, There is a problem of overlapping categories, which really needs to be understood. Now, I'm not quite sure what problem Steph is referring to here, but given his philosophical ability, it must be an immense one. So we'll leave him to it and move on to the next section, which is wildly more entertaining. I said things are finally getting interesting, uh, because this is the first section in which Steph throws out a bunch of formal arguments. Um, and it is the one on deductive reasoning. So far, so good. Uh, ostensibly here, Steph is trying to explain what makes a deductive argument bad. But, since Steph is bad at deductive argumentation, his endeavour is not entirely successful. Uh, let's jump aboard this train wreck with the first example, which says, All plumbers can swim. Bob knows how to swim. Therefore, Bob is a plumber. Now, to his credit, this first example is fine. The argument goes wrong because it does not preclude the possibility of non-plumbers swimming, or of Bob being among the non-plumbers. So, yeah, if your argument doesn't preclude the negation of its conclusion, it's not a good deductive argument. So far, so sane. Um, what about example two? An example two is that kind people are socialists, Bob is a kind person, and therefore Bob is a socialist. And we're going to discuss this one next to three, since they share the exact same problem. And three says, kind people support the welfare state, Bob is a kind person, therefore Bob supports the welfare state. That shared problem between examples two and three, if you were wondering, is ambiguity. Unlike example one, Steph doesn't quantify either two or three. The thing is, both first premises are incomplete. Uh, we need to know whether Steph intends to say that all kind people do X, or merely some kind people do X. If we say all, then both arguments are valid and fine examples of good deductive arguments. Presumably, then, Steph intends us to read them as saying some. But this should be made explicit. As it stands, these are examples of fallacies of ambiguity, not bad deductive reasoning. Some of you might be wondering, since both 2 and 3 are quite similar to 1, why is it that the latter 2 would be valid, while the first is invalid, when all are universally quantified? Let's first represent the similarity between the two arguments. So, the first one is, all P are S, B is S, therefore B is P, and the second is all K are S, B is K, therefore B is S. So in light of the similarity, what do you think the relevant difference is here? The respective first premises tell us that if someone is a plumber, they swim, and if someone is kind, they're a socialist. What we are not told by these premises is that all swimmers are plumbers, or all socialists are kind. There could be non-plumbers swimming and unkind socialists. Example 1 goes wrong in inferring from the fact that Bob is a swimmer to the conclusion that he is a plumber. However, in the second example, the inference that Bob is kind does lead to the conclusion that he is a socialist in light of premise 1. We can represent this quite simply logically using only one connective, the conditional, or if-then operator. Basically, a statement of the form, if P, then Q, is false only when the antecedent P is true and the consequent Q, false. So if the first term is true and the second is false, then a conditional statement is false. Um, if you find this strange, you're not alone, but it is a far bigger issue than we have time to address here. For now, just think of it as being to do with the strictness of logic. We could only really say an if-then statement was categorically false if the antecedent does occur and the consequent fails to. Um, our translation would then become, for one, if P then S, if B then S, therefore if B then P. And 2 would become if K then S, if B then K, therefore if B then S. So look back at 1. First, we are not told that if a thing is S, uh, it is a P, which is what we would need in order to reach the conclusion. Compare with 2, where we are told that if something is K, it is S. So be mindful that a simple swapping of the side of the variables can impact validity. This is why, even though it might seem perfectly natural to assume these are intended to be universally quantified, like the first example, that cannot be, or both would come out valid. And we're supposed to be looking at invalid arguments here. 
Uh, we must assume then that Steph's only error is in failing to specify that he meant some and not all. Of course, that isn't so bad. So what if Steph didn't explicitly write every little detail? He is a busy man, and the point was conveyed all the same, so we might insist on locating the harm. Well, I'm afraid that was just the beginning. Uh, we're going to skip example 4 for now, because it's mostly fine. But much more importantly, in his next attempt at showing us what an invalid argument looks like, Steph actually does something quite remarkable. Something he's never done before. He makes a valid argument. That's right, Molyneux is so bad at logic that when he's actively trying to make a bad argument, something which should be as natural as breathing to him at this point, he actually ends up doing the exact opposite. I mean, <laughs> please, I'm telling you, it looks ridiculous. It really, really does, you know? <laughs> I just don't think it's really going to work out that way. I have to tell you, <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, it's just pretty funny when you think about it. <laughs> now, I imagine some Molyneux fans watching this might be staring incredulously at their screens at this point. Now, didn't I just say that it was easy to mistake one end of a conditional for another, or make some other slight mishap which could also affect validity? Um, haven't I heard of the preface paradox? Um, he's only human, so what if one example out of eight is actually the opposite of what it's supposed to exemplify? And I take your point, or at least I would, if this had only happened once. But in fact, all of the remaining examples are valid too, and it seems neither Steph nor any of his editors were aware of this. If I had to do it all over, oh wait, I am doing it all over again, and by God, I'm doing the same thing. Now before ending this episode, we'll take a look at the first of these hilarious testaments to Steph's ineptitude. But because the episode's already running longer than I'd intended, I'm only going to show you the basic propositional formulation and test today. In the next episode, we'll go through the rest of the examples, and I'll also show you the corresponding predicate translations and tests. So, behold, example 5. People are either mean or kind. Kind people want children to be educated. Only the government can educate children. Bob opposes government education. Therefore, Bob opposes children being educated. And therefore, Bob is a mean person. First, we need to go about translating this into logispeak. Um, predicate logic would offer a more accurate translation, though the corresponding methods of translation and proof are far more complicated and difficult than I have so far prepared you for. In any case, the predicate translation comes to the same results as the propositional, so don't worry yet about lost nuance. And I will be going through it again in a further video. For now, we'll stick with the propositional logic we've been using thus far. So, premise 1 looks remarkably like a disjunction, which we can write as either people are mean or people are kind, or M or K. Note, we could also include the people part here, by placing a conditional before our disjunction, turning premise 1 into if something is a person, then it's mean or kind. Now, this also has no knock-on effect on validity, and further complicates the argument, so it too will be dropped for simplicity of explanation here. And though I will show it at the end, for any skeptics. Premise 2 says that kind people want children educated. Now, a conditional seems appropriate for this, but which term should go first? Well, let's try both and see which fits. So first we'd have if E then K, which means if something wants children educated, it is kind. But this would imply that everything that wants children educated is kind, while our original statement claims only that at least the kind things want children educated. Now, this leaves it open that there could be unkind things which want children educated for unkind reasons. If we say instead, if K then E, well then we have something which says roughly if you are kind, then you want children educated, which seems to better appropriate the statement Steph wants to make. Now, when we look now at premise 3, the phrase only should stick out to us. Now, if we go about this with the conditional in the same fashion as last time, naturally forming the proposition as if G then E, uh, if something is the government, then it can educate children, uh, that would miss an important detail in the premise. 
So we're told only government can educate children. Uh, and this is better captured by flipping the terms in the conditional to if E then G, which has the effect of saying if something educates children, then it must be the government. So this pair of premises nicely indicates the importance of watching your conditionals. If you're ever unsure, just try out a couple of options and see what you think better captures the authorial intent or maximizes charity. Now next is premise 4, which would be natural enough in predicate logic as there exists an X such that X is Bob and Bob opposes government education, or E of X, uh, B of X, and not G of X. But since we're limiting ourselves to propositional logic, we'll have to get a bit creative here. And what we're trying to express is that there's an individual named Bob who opposes government education. It might seem natural to use a conjunction, something like Bob exists and opposes government, or B and not G. But that wouldn't capture logically the connection between being Bob and not supporting government. Uh, a better proposal is if B, then not G, or if someone is Bob, they oppose government education. Uh, again, if you try flipping the terms, you would get the unintuitive claim that everything which opposes government education is Bob. Uh, what a world that would be. Um, at last, we come to the conclusions, which say that Bob opposes children's education, and is thus mean. We will follow our former practice for transcribing Bob in conditionals, but now we can use a conjunction to simplify things. Rather than having two separate conclusions, like Steph, we can join the two together. Now, this works because our translation is using a conditional, and both conclusions are conditionals starting with the same term. Um, really, all we're dropping is an unnecessary repetition of if someone is Bob, then um, leaving us with the conclusion uh, if B, then not E and M, or if someone is Bob, they don't support children's education and are mean. And that would make our argument in total then, M or K, if K then E, if E then G, if B then not G, therefore if B then not E and M. Now that we've carefully translated our argument, how do we test it? Well, we're going to use my favorite propositional logic test, um, called the indirect truth table method. Um, understanding and applying this test correctly is quick, easy, and relatively painless. What we do is assume all the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Given what we said about validity, if it's possible for us to do this with an argument without contradicting ourselves, we know it must be invalid. Or that's the general idea anyway. Let's start, as you always should in this method, with the conclusion. And this is where deduction gets a bit more exciting. Um, so to make the conclusion false, what must we do? Hopefully you'll recall that a conditional is false only when its first term is true and its second false. Uh, which tells us that B must be true everywhere in this argument. It also tells us the conjunction following B must be false. Um, but since there are a couple of ways we could do that, uh, given what we know, we're better off figuring out what else follows from B first. Premise 4 is our next logical stop then, where we make B true, and also the overall premise. Remember, the method requires making all the premises true overall, and logically this amounts to applying a T to the outermost operator, or the one which will be solved last in determining the proposition's truth. And from this, we can infer G's truth value. Um, we see a negation before g, meaning whatever value g has will be flipped in this proposition. Now, in order to make the whole proposition true, g must come out false so that it changes to true. Um, and since we must be consistent, g must be false throughout the argument. Let's look now at premises containing g, uh, like premise 3. And since g is false, we know that e must be false too, um, because if it were not, the whole proposition would be false. And the same reasoning applies to premise 2. Uh, given that E is false, K must be false too. And at last, we are led back to premise 1. Um, and in 1, we know K is false. So in order to make the whole thing true, we need M to be true. And that's because a disjunction is only true when at least one of its terms is true. But before committing to this interpretation, let's look back to that tricky conjunction in the conclusion. Uh, we know now that one part of that, not E, will be true 
since E is false, the rest of the argument. Now that means that M will have to be false, otherwise the conjunction will come out true, and with it, the whole proposition. And remember, the conclusion is the one proposition here you don't want coming out true. Um, but now, when we look back at premise 1, we can't make it true if both M and K are false, um, so we're stuck. Now you can try running through a few other interpretations for yourself if you'd like, uh, but this is what you'll find in general. And finding yourself in this spot, where there's no way of consistently applying values so as to have all the premises true and the conclusion false, indicates that the argument is valid. Remember, validity means the premises entail the conclusion, so true premises plus validity equals true conclusion. Well, what we've just done here, symbolically, is to show that there are no cases in which all of this argument's premises are true and its conclusion is false. Meaning, in all cases where the premises are true, the conclusion is true, and hence the argument's validity. And that is how Stefan Molyneux finally made a valid argument, by trying to make an invalid one. Um, on the bright side, this is about as successful as Molyneux's ever been at making logical arguments. Uh, maybe he ought to try it more often. Well, that's probably more than enough for one day. Um, if you have any questions, ask away. Next time, we'll be finding out how Steph could make this bewildering mistake on more than one occasion, discussing synonym logic, or analyticity to everyone else. And the episode after that, we'll be looking at Steph's famous objection to Hume's Law, which will be very interesting. Um, I'm intending this to be a running series, but I won't be devoting all my time to it. For those interested in my previous videos will be happy to know I'm working on a final vegan video, one which addresses the complaints I've received from the first two, the main one being that no one understood the damn thing. So next time I'm bringing slow, methodical proofs, um, and I will also be responding to some of the more idiotic comments, including Ask Yourselves. So fun times ahead. That being said, Fuck off, I got work to do.